Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dennis, my old friend. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to come to this very important uh, symposium that is important uh, to all of us around the Indian Ocean uh, countries and countries uh, on the peripheral as well as the interland of it. Now, I'm going to say a few words about the uh, Indonesian perspective on the Indian Ocean. First, Indonesia actually has spent a lot of time in the past and a lot of attention to deal with the Indian Ocean, uh, primarily because we are on the edge of it. And therefore, it is an important part of our daily life. If I can remember, even some 2,000 years ago, Indonesia has already traveled all the way to East Africa and settled quite a lot of them in Madagascar at that time that indicate to us, you know, how important is the Indian Ocean to uh, Indonesia. Now, let me go a little bit uh, beyond that. Our main attention to the Indian Ocean after independence actually came uh, in 1955 when we organized the Asian African Conference in Bandung, which in the way in our mind was Indian Ocean would be a bridge between Asia and Africa. That was the main uh, opinion that we had in mind at the time. And therefore, uh, when we organized the Asian African Conference, uh, we bring in uh, quite a lot of uh, countries uh, in Asia and Africa. And at that time also, we encourage the countries in Africa and Asia to uh, obtain and gain independence so that later on we can uh, develop together in the independent atmosphere, in the free atmosphere uh, from all the historical past that uh, has uh, bound us. Next to it, we see then the development of the Cold War in the Indian Ocean. That upset a little bit the effort because the Cold War tried also to bring in Cold War to the Indian Ocean. I remember at that time there was an effort by uh, Madagascar, I think, to create or to bring a conference of the Indian Ocean, but with a political motivation as a result of the Cold War. And uh, therefore was not very uh, successful. And uh, at the end of it, we don't really participate too much in that kind of uh, activities. This is, of course, uh, one good lesson for us also, that our interest in the Indian Oceans uh, actually should be managed by us in, around Indian Ocean countries, and we should not be influenced too much by the existing or by the developing Cold War at that time. Next, of course, uh, we find out other factors that may be important for the development of the cooperation. One of them is fisheries. All of us around Indian Oceans have a fisheries interest because uh, that is important to the livelihood of our own uh, common people. Now, as a result of that, of course, uh, we are uh, trying also to develop cooperative arrangement with regard to uh, how to manage the fisheries resources and several kind of activities are also are taking a place on that one. Then, in the modern world later on, develop also our interest in mineral resources. And we find it out that uh, one of our uh, country around Indian Ocean apparently has also developed, uh, developed uh, important science and technology as well as activity with regard to seabed mining. We find it out later on that India has already worked intensively on this and developed already the uh, metallic, polymetallic model, nodules technology on how to explore it and how to exploit it. India later on submitted application to the International Seabed Authority and get observation, and get uh, exploratory right in the middle of the Indian Ocean 
which now, of course, uh, India has uh, been able to develop uh, sufficient science and technology on that one. I personally like to suggest, of course, that this advanced science and technology that India has already developed with regard to mineral resources exploration in the seabed area could be shared somehow also with the other Indian Ocean countries so that they also could take advantage of the mineral resources. Uh, I've been to India a couple of times and see that, that their technology are already very advanced on this one. And it would be very useful, I think, uh, if other countries around the Indian Ocean could also take advantage of the resources, of the mineral resources there. And then we also find it out later on that some other countries are beginning to be interested with the mineral resources. Uh, one of them, very clearly, uh, China. Uh, China has been very much interested in the metal crust resources of the uh, southwest Indian Ocean mountain ridge that uh, they have also applied to the International Seabird Authority and has already obtained also exploratory right for those uh, resources in the Southwest Indian Ocean Sea Mound uh, at the bottom of the ocean for uh, mineral resources. Other countries later on show interest in that one. Uh, I understand, for instance, uh, the Republic of Korea also uh, showing some uh, interest in this one. So we have already two kind of uh, mineral resources potentials in the Indian Ocean, namely the polymetallic nodules, which India has already been the expert on this, and the uh, sea mount metal crust at the sea bottom, where in, uh, China is already uh, very much experienced uh, on this. Again, if we can develop some cooperative relation on this one, it would be really uh, very interesting. Now, in view of all this, what have we done in the past? Indonesia, for instance, for a long time has established the Center for the Study of the Indian Ocean in West Sumatra, in the university there. And in fact, uh, if someone could remember, Sukarno at one moment even called the eastern part of the Indian Ocean as uh, Samudra Indonesia, as Indonesian Samudra, as Indonesian Ocean, simply with the purpose of trying to encourage Indonesia to think that they are in the middle of the, of the Indian Ocean, that they are in the center of the Indian Ocean activities, so that they will pay uh, more attention to it. But apparently later on, the wording of uh, Samudra Indonesia or Indonesian Ocean has not been developed because I think it has not been reported to the UN uh, geographical name and, 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 and so forth. Now, the other thing is that uh, Already in the late 60s, if I could remember, we worked together to establish Indian Ocean Marine Affairs Cooperation, IOMAC, that is centered in Colombo. IOMAC has been doing quite a lot of studies in the past with regard to the resources, environmental management, fisheries, and other cooperative efforts. Now, after so many years, IOMAC now has seemed to be not working at full time anymore because not enough uh, uh, support anymore to them. And therefore, uh, in my mind, IOMAC should continue to be supported by all of us in the Indian Ocean area. Now, another thing is that uh, here in Perth, that one perhaps forget that Curtin University developed a study program on the IFIOR at the time, that is International Forum for Indian Ocean Region, here at the Curtin University in Perth, in which all of us participated in the discussion what to do with the Indian Ocean and how we should develop cooperative relationship and, and so forth. But uh, unfortunately, I don't hear very much anymore also of the IFIOR uh, in activities. Uh, hopefully, that will be revised in order to, uh, for us to take more uh, interest and in activities in the activities. At the same time, in India, 
I know and I have attended a meeting of Indian Ocean Research Group, for instance, where Dennis knows very well, uh, at Chandigarh University, that also spent a lot of attention and time to study Indian Ocean and how to develop cooperative relations uh, with that. Uh, but now, again, uh, Chandigarh University, from time to time, uh, we don't hear much anymore what they have been doing now. So maybe again, I would suggest that it could be revived again if that kind of activity is uh, be considered very useful. I consider that very useful uh, anyway. Now, later on, those efforts that we are trying to do is not really governmental. Mostly uh, the second track kind of activities. Second track means academic kind of activities. Uh, involving government in a full activities is not an easy way to do because then a uh, matter of policy involved, but matter of uh, uh, activities and financing, budget, and so forth. But in the end, we were successful, I think, in creating the Indian Ocean uh, Rim Association for Regional Cooperation, IORAC, that uh, after a couple of meetings later on, we agreed to establish the secretariat in Mauritius. Uh, this is what we heard today. IORAC now has developed into Indian Ocean Rim Association. That is uh, some kind of a model which is uh, much more useful uh, to do. Again, I would imagine that uh, the IORA, Indian Ocean Rim Association for Regional Cooperation, would continue to encourage this kind of a, a cooperative uh, relationship. There is uh, another factors that uh, we need to do uh, on this one. There have been quite a lot of uh, change in political outlook among countries either outside of the Indian Ocean or inside the Indian Ocean, that we should be able to transform that into cooperative relationship. But what we find sometimes is they are not cooperative format, but competitive format, in the sense that uh, not, not, not the format that I would like uh, to see. Uh, for instance, we all know now that uh, the uh, United States is more interested in the Indian Ocean. Fine. Uh, India is interested no, well, in Southeast Asia. Fine also. And India has been uh, suggesting the policy of uh, changing look east to act east, to engage east, and, and whatever east is. And then these are all good things. But the point is, how do we see that these two model of more attention to Indian Ocean and more attention to the other region could be developed into some kind of uh, cooperative relationship rather than uh, co competitive, uh, some kind, competitive kind uh, of, of relationship. Now, in my, in my mind, uh, there are other factors, of course, that uh, we should take into consideration uh, in all this kind of thing. But let's see, what can we do with this? From the legal perspective, for instance, I noticed that all of us in the Indian Ocean are members of the United Nations. And therefore, whatever happened, we should be abide by the UN Charter. That is, for peaceful purposes, cooperative kind of relationship, and, and that, that's force. In other words, all our activities and program and suggestions should be in, along the line with the uh, UN uh, Charter. The other important factor is that uh, I notice also of all of us are members of the UNCLOS, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And for that, it's also important to take into account the international uh, law of the sea on this kind of th two things. There are two agreements that are already valid for Indian Ocean as a result of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. One is the implementing agreement of 1994 dealing with the resources of the seabed area. Now, I know that that agreement has already been in force, this implementing agreement dealing with the seabed resources. But I think not many of us yet realize the significance of that agreement and understanding of the matter. Now, perhaps here, somebody who knows about that agreement like India who has been implementing it, who have already applied for the resources in the International Seabed Authority in Jamaica, uh, could also begin to 
or spread the knowledge on that one so that it could become uh, uh, the basis for exploration and exploitation later on of the mineral resources of the Indian Ocean by the countries around the Indian Ocean, which so far do not have yet enough attention to the seabed mineral resources of the Indian Ocean. The other implementing agreement was the, what we call is the Fish Talk Agreement of 1995 that managed the resources of the ocean that are straddling and highly migratory species like tuna. And there is, that agreement is already in force also with the headquarters in Seychelles now uh, in, in the Indian Ocean. Now, th that kind of agreement also uh, could be spread and hopefully also will help countries around the Indian Ocean to take benefit and to take advantage of the living resources uh, of the Indian Ocean. Now, of course, there have been a couple of agreements and international convention dealing with the fisheries resources. Like here, for instance, the Convention on Sorcerer and Bluefin Tuna, the CCSBT headquartered in Canberra, that are dealing with the management, dealing with the exploitation of the uh, Southern Bluefin Tuna one of the most expensive uh, fish resources uh, around the world that are exploited in the Indian Ocean. And I hope, of course, that in that context, maybe Australia could play the role in spreading the knowledge of the Southern Bluefin Tuna for the benefit of the Indian Ocean countries that uh, could take advantage of those uh, uh, tuna resources. Again, there is already the, already the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization uh, on the uh, IOTC, Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, that is uh, also something very important that uh, exploit the resources uh, of the Indian Ocean. Again, in this particular cases, I would hope that somehow uh, more knowledge and more understanding uh, could be spread over and could be understanding on that one. Another topic that is dealing for this cooperation is Indian Ocean is a very large country. There are a lot of uh, regional, sub-regional seas around Indian Ocean, like Bay of Bengal, uh, Arab Sea, Arabian Sea, and, and so forth. It would be very nice also if sub-regional seas like that develop cooperative program. It is also important to note that South China Sea surrounding the Indian Ocean also, like the Timor Sea and so forth. A lot of cooperative programs are already being done and being attempted in the South China Sea, in Timor Sea, uh, and so forth. Maybe uh, if they have more time later on, I could explain more, as was mentioned this morning, whatever we have done with regard to promoting cooperation in the South China Sea within the last 20 years or so. There are a lot of competition. There are a lot of factors that would divide us, but our effort is to find factors that will unite us. Uh, that is not an easy thing, but something that is worth trying. And I think in Indian Ocean also, we should find out factors that will help us to work together rather than uh, will help us uh, fight against each other. Now, there are two models again that is important for the Indian Ocean. First, for many years, the Strait of Malacca become an area of contention between the maritime powers and the coastal countries. But in the end, through cooperative mechanism, we have been able to overcome that, using again the law of the Sea Convention as the basis, with cooperation with IMO, in cooperation with the user state, in cooperation with the local countries, with the coastal state, and so forth. And I think we have been able to manage that also, uh, the use of the Strait of Malacca and Singapore that have been discussed uh, this morning. Another thing is the passage issues through the Strait of Indonesian waters, what we call is the archipelagic sea lanes, archipelagic waters. Again, we have been able to manage that through some kind of cooperative relationship with IMO, and now it has been uh, working out very well. Now, one of the problems that I don't know very much in the Indian Ocean, but today somebody mentioned, is what about the territorial problems? Yes, in the South China Sea, territorial problem is a big problem, but maybe much bigger than the problem that exists in the Indian Ocean. But I think solution to the territorial problems can also be found out in many ways. 
Indonesia and Malaysia has a territorial problem. We go to the court. Malaysia and Singapore has territorial problem. They go to the court. In the South China Sea, they have territorial problem. They try to talk to each other, and we encourage them to talk to each other. Some of them we have been able to do, but some of them had not been able to be managed. Another problem that we know is problem of piracy. That has been discussed quite a lot. And international terrorism, that has been discussed quite a lot. And I think a lot of cooperative relationship can be worked out in that. And I think INS could do a lot also on the piracy and so forth. One probably rather encouraging sign is that piracy, which was so uh, widespread before, particularly in Somalia, uh, now seems to have reduced somehow. Now, my feeling is that uh, my hope that this uh, will be finishing soon, you know, so that there will be no more piracy in, in, in the future. Uh, hopefully, that can also be uh, important. This morning, I heard something about the climate change and the possibility of study uh, sea level rise. Yes, we are quite aware of that. In the South China Sea, we have been aware of that for a couple of years. And we have been doing also uh, some workshop dealing with this sea level rise, appointing some working group. And now we have already developed certain basic knowledge with regard to the sea level rise in the uh, South China Sea. Maybe this could also be learned and could also be employed in the uh, Indian Ocean region because there are quite a lot of experts in the Indian Ocean region. Only maybe we have not been able to uh, sort of uh, manage that. One factor that have not been mentioned, but I think it is important to note, Indian Ocean, we just had experience of tsunami, which is 10 years ago. A very devastating kind of thing. Indonesia lost 200,000 people. Some countries around the Indian Ocean, like Sri Lanka, India, and even some East Africa, also lost a lot of people as a result of tsunami. Maybe this is, again, another area where we can uh, promote cooperation, where INOS, IONS could be uh, instrumental in uh, trying to compare experience, to learn from experience, what can we do in the future to prepare ourselves if that kind of calamity took place again, so that it does not take so much life like what like it did uh, in 2004 uh, uh, around Sumatra, in North Sumatra. So I would encourage again, this is an area where cooperative kind of relationship uh, could uh, be worked out. Lately, there has been a lot of problem with regard to the uh, people trafficking, drug trafficking. Indonesia suffers a lot because of the drug trafficking. Uh, Indonesia also suffers a lot because of these uh, migrants, illegal migrants and so forth, unregulated migrants. But I think what we don't have up to now is there seems to be no understanding yet between the country of origin and the country of transit and the country of destination of the migrants. I would suggest perhaps that country of destination of that migrants should really take initiative in trying to discuss with the country of origin as well as the country of transit, what could we do so that no violation of human right, but at the same time also uh, not disturbing any stability in the area and, and, and so forth. There don't seem to be uh, much being done on this. Also, I know that you, uh, UN Human Rights Commission is trying to do something about that, but uh, so far uh, we are not yet uh, uh, finished with uh, trying to do that one. Now, le let me say in conclusion before uh, I finish my, my time. In, in my opinion, there are a lot of things that we could do together in a collaborative manner on this kind of issue. First of all, I repeat, Australia could do something to spread knowledge about the living resources, about the uh, tuna that they have been able to manage well. And at the same time, they also have to be able to spread the knowledge with regard to the continental shelf and continental margin. In fact, I remember during the Low of the Sea Conference, Australia was one of the main proponents 
of the claim to the continental shelf beyond 200 miles in the area uh, of the Indian Ocean, as well as in the, Indian, uh, in the Pacific Ocean and so forth. So this will benefit, I think, most country in, uh, in the Indian Ocean. The second thing is I would encourage that uh, India, for instance, should take the lead in spreading the knowledge and science and technology with regard to the exploration and mining of the seabed resources in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the uh, Indian Ocean, outside of the jurisdiction of any country, because the India has already obtained some kind of right on that one uh, from the International uh, Seabed Authority in Jamaica. Next to that is, uh, I would suggest that FAO, for instance, should also concentrate a little bit in spreading the knowledge with regard to the CCSBT and IOTC, which is uh, formulated under the, I I K under the uh, FAO rules. Now, with regard to the e economic zone, which was the basis of the Indian Ocean activities and many of the coastal countries at the time taking advantage of it, I think we should take advantage of it as much as possible. Many of us in the Indian Ocean have not been able to take a lot of uh, advantage with regard to the uh, economic zone. And a lot of us too may not be aware of all our activities and our obligation with regard to the economic zone, like the protection of the environment, like the conduct of marine scientific research and, and so forth in that area. Now, finally, somebody mentioned today that perhaps the approach of one and a half track activities could be attempted. I would agree with that and I would support that because uh, one and a half track activities in our practice with regard to South China Sea is we invited people that are coming in their personal capacity, but they are appointed by the government. Uh, this is to make it easier to discuss things, particularly in the South China Sea because there are a lot of territorial conflict and people cannot come to a formal meeting but if they come into scientific meeting also has not produced uh, much uh, result. One of the most important activities of this uh, one and a half track diplomacy is that uh, you can bring anyone who have an interest. Uh, my problem sometimes in the Indian Ocean is because uh, there is a tendency to exclude someone whom he don't like. Uh, that's what we don't do in the South China Sea. In the South China Sea workshop, we bring together China and Taiwan to sit down. And they come and they do sit down, but one and a half track. They participated, their government upon them, but when they come, they come in their own personal capacity. That is simply one model of bringing them uh, together. Uh, maybe this kind of model could also bring uh, into life in the uh, Indian Ocean and so forth. Now, finally, what I would like to mention is that uh, there are so many things we could do uh, in the uh, Indian Ocean. In the South China Sea, if I can mention, we start with trying to write some kind of uh, basic principle for working together. That's what we did 21 years ago, 22 years ago, in the first meeting and in the second meeting in Bali and in Bandung, where we at the time agreed on some kind of six basic principles to work. First, we shall not discuss uh, territorial problem because that is beyond our jurisdiction. We concentrate on scientific, we concentrate on environment, we concentrate on technical things. And as a result of that, later on, that agreeing basic agreement, it took 11 years to become a declaration of conduct in the South China Sea that was signed by the ASEAN countries and China. That later on again now, we're trying to make it into a much more legal binding document into a code of conduct. Maybe we don't have some kind of declaration of conduct on the South China Sea yet, because we don't have yet the basic principle and the modalities how to promote cooperative relationship uh, in the area. Now, here, in this case, if Australia, now they want that uh, already supportive of this kind of uh, effort of cooperation in the Indian Ocean, could take the initiative. How can we exercise this one and a half track diplomacy in the Indian Ocean 
by first how to promote cooperation by devising a dev basic document on cooperative relationship and uh, some kind of uh, declaration of conduct that later on will guide us in the activities uh, of promoting cooperation in the uh, Indian Ocean region. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.